Kia ora koutou katoa, no mai, haere mai. Uh, to all of those who are joining us from this morning session, welcome back. And to all those joining us for the first time today, welcome to day four of this amazing conference. Uh, ko Taylor Ho, I am Taylor and I am the uh, MC for today's uh, sessions. And now I'm going to hand over to Ashleen Rain, who is going to be the session chair. Kia ora Taylor, kia ora tato. Uh, welcome to session seven on adaptive governance and policy. This team aims to break the mold and build new systems, policies and capability that will provide much greater protection to our bioheritage, including by embracing treaty relationships with Māori and investigating the many opportunities for the environment that can arise when the, when the government engages in the co-design of policy and co-governance of national resources. And first up, we have Kali O'Connor uh, talking about Te Wai Māori. Uh, Kali is Ngāti Kahunganu ki Te Wairoa and Ngāti Tūwharu Toa. She is Waipuna, Acting Manager for Te Wai Māori Trust, where her work focuses on policy, legislation and mahi related to developing and supporting freshwater taonga research and other initiatives. I uh, know my Kali. Oh, kia ora tato. So as I was just introduced, called Kali Raiha O'Connor Tōku Ingwa. Ko uria ho no ngati kahunu nu kite wairo me tu fare toa ko o te kai fakahare i te wai Māori Trust. So kia ora, it's great to be here. I am just going to speak to you briefly about some of the mahi the trust has been undertaking to uphold Māori rights and interests in freshwater fisheries. Um, and I'm here because we've been working alongside Ali, Cowan, and Maria, who you'll be hearing from soon. So Te Wai Māori Trust was established under the Māori Fisheries Act and we work on behalf of 58 mandated iwi organisations. So our role is to advance the interests of iwi and Māori and freshwater fisheries and this includes through the protection and enhancement of freshwater fisheries and habitat. So the Trust is governed by a board of directors and that's chaired by Donna Flavel. Um, and we have a small, a very small team of staff located in Wellington on the terrace who support the board. So in terms of our key work programs, protecting Māori interests in freshwater fisheries ultimately means protecting habitat to ensure we have good water quality, healthy and abundant species, and that iwi and hapu are empowered to uphold their responsibilities regarding freshwater fisheries. So one of the ways that we work towards this is through supporting freshwater research and other initiatives. So we recently supported a project with the South Wairarapa Marae Group, um, looking at Kopapa Māori measures of freshwater health and to assist them with identifying freshwater values as part of the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. So for this, we engaged Caleb Royal, who is a researcher and lecturer at Te Wānanga Orokawa and he facilitated two, workshop, two workshops focused on developing a training program for monitoring mahinga kai, and in this case it was tuna, and provided training on determining tuna age and, and kind of getting indications of their health um, by way of the otolith or ear bone. And he also looked at the impact of um, pest species in the rohe on tuna and on waterways in general. So we also have a, an Indigenous Freshwater Species Work Program, and this is focused around kind of some key taonga species, so tuna, pihoro, kanakana, and inanga. So for tuna and pihoro, kanakana, um, we have two eerie steering groups that help inform our work program and our research priorities. So it's awesome to have those little supporting us. Um, and another way is through our two fresh water funds we administer. So that's the Wai Water and Tiakiwai funds. And these funds provide many iwi, hapu and community groups with funding to undertake freshwater fisheries research, habitat restoration, and to revitalize connections with freshwater taonga. And so this is just an image showing the location of the 10 projects we have funded this year. Um, eight of them are located in Te Ika Maui and two in Te Waipounamu. So this is a quote from Lisa Tehuhu. She is the former chair of Te Wai Māori Trust and the current CE of Te Uhu Kaimoana. And this speaks to another key component of our work program, which entails responding to legislative reform and policy. And key to that is upholding te tiriti or waitangi. 
So the Fisheries Deed of Settlement reaffirmed the Te Tiriti partnership between the Crown and Māori, and through this, iwi expect a partnership with the Crown on strategic issues that impact freshwater fisheries and marine environments. So this includes a desire to collaborate and co-design policy and regulations, which requires full iwi and hapu participation and a commitment from the Crown to collaborate in good faith and build strong, enduring relationships. So over the last couple of years for the Trust, this has meant a key component of our work program has been supporting the Freshwater Iwi Leaders Group and their technicians in seeking to ensure that the rangatiratanga of iwi and hapu guaranteed under Te Tiriti is upheld in the government's ongoing resource management and freshwater reform processes. So we believe that the Crown agencies must engage in manner enhancing Te Tiriti processes to formulate Tonga freshwater fisheries policies and regulations. Our view is that the development of policy and regulations that acknowledge cultural values, incorporate Mataranga Māori and provide a role for iwi and hapu in decision making and implementation would significantly add to improved understanding of freshwater taonga and better provide for their ongoing health, well-being and abundance, which ultimately is of benefit to everyone. So that brings me to the end of my corridor. Um, ngā mihi kia koutou katoa, kia ora. Kia ora Kali. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our next speakers, Carwin Jones and Maria ba uh, Baj. They're talking on strengthening rangatiratanga supports, everyone. Uh, Carwin is Ngāti Kahungunu, uh, co-lead with Maria of SO7. Um, He's booking a matua in the Ahunga Tikanga program of Māori Laws and Philosophy at Te Wānanga Orokawa and an honorary adjunct professor in Te Kawa a Māori School of Māori Studies at Te Hiringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, Maria is Te Arawa Ngāti Awa. She is Associate Professor also at Te Kawa a Māori. She's published extensively, extensively on topics related to Māori politics, local and general elections, climate change and Māori resource management. She is 2020 recipient of the Royal Society Te Pua Waitanga Research Excellence Award and we'll be hearing a pre-recorded talk from them. Um, take it away. Tēnā koutou katoa, he mihi mahana kia koutou. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about rangatiratanga and why it's good for everybody, uh, but we wanted to start by giving you a little sense of some of the research that we've been doing and the evidence we've been collecting and observations that we've been making. And one of those observations is that amongst our students, our colleagues, the government officials that we work with, we're seeing a real desire to deepen connections um, to Aotearoa by learning about tikanga, uh, te reo Māori and mātauranga Māori. And what we're seeing are, is a real desire for just relationships. At Te Kawa Māori, um, Te Heringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, where I am, uh, we see a huge increase in the number of Pākehā and Tauiwi students that we have in our classes. And they are all really keen and eager to learn about tikanga, te tiriti, and how to be good allies. In some of our courses, we've even seen the dynamic in, uh, of the numbers of Māori students to Pākehā Tauiwi students really shift. And that enthuses and excites us that there's this desire out there for these just relationships. We can see this in the legal profession and in legal education as well. Uh, so the New Zealand Council for Legal Education has indicated that in law faculties across the country, uh, students will need to learn about tikanga Māori as a first source of law. Uh, and New Zealand law has always had the ability to recognise tikanga as Māori customary law, where a particular practice could be proved as a custom and where it didn't conflict with statute or fundamental principles of the common law. But in recent years, we've seen a shift where the courts are beginning to recognise tikanga as a source of law itself. And this is enabling the New Zealand legal system to develop in ways which not only respect tikanga, but better reflect Aotearoa. And to draw on a whole another set of legal tools to resolve conflict uh, and establish and maintain good, strong, constructive relationships. 
in terms of the government agencies that we're um, liaising with, this is Ministry for the Environment, Department of Conservation, across the spectrum, really, back to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, we see a real attentiveness to engaging with Māori, to also thinking about co-design of policy with Māori uh, and co-governing uh, with Māori. And so that's <laughs> areas, that's the dog, in areas from national security to natural resources. So we all benefit from focusing on developing and maintaining just relationships in our society. If we prioritise mutual respect, balance and mutual benefit in relationships within and across our diverse communities, then we enable different voices to be heard in decision making and we encourage participation in all areas of public life. So everyone is encouraged to bring their strengths and knowledge together to address the social and environmental challenges we face. Everyone wins when we have good, balanced, respectful relationships with each other and with the world we live in. For too long, really tired ideas have allowed injustice and a privileged minority to dominate. Stale ideas from quite a way away have held dominance over our unique systems of government and politics. Narrow ideas of liberal democracy, which have been crafted in Europe, and British colonialism have been widely criticized by scholars for being founded on assumptions of Western superiority and the imposition of Western forms of government over indigenous peoples and their forms of government. And such ideas have led to stale, pale, male political dominance and decision-making. At a local government level, this has produced representation that does not reflect the Tariti partnership that's at the heart of our democracy. And decisions uh, about the environment have tended to shut Māori out um, of the decision-making process uh, with often negative results. So there we're seeing examples around the draining of wetlands, which have had really devastating consequences, or the discharge of effluent directly into waterways where families used to swim or collect their kai. At a national level, the failure of the healthcare system to adequately support Māori to design and deliver a primary healthcare to Māori has contributed to the severe health inequities experienced by Māori. So based on all of this, <laughs> we're suggesting that we no longer need these stale ideas and really they should be retired. What we need and the demand we see from students, from our colleagues, community groups and government officials are solutions that draw together our different strengths to create more just uh, relationships, to recognise rights and obligations, and to gener generate better outcomes for us all. Our ancestors bravely initiated a shared path for us under Te Tiriti o Waitangi, where respectful and balanced partnerships would embrace both Tinoranga Tiritanga and Kawanatanga. And this is the basis of our unique liberal democracy. Less about J.S. Mill and more about Aotearoa. We need to bring together our strengths, such as the intergenerational knowledge Māori have of ecosystems and use protection mechanisms such as rāhui alongside Western science knowledge systems and ways of approaching the environment. It's Tutility provides a framework for shared decision making based on the recognition of rights and a respect for the exercise of both Tinoranga Tiritanga and Kawanatanga here in Aotearoa. Properly giving effect to the relationship established in Tutility opens up opportunities for a respectful and innovative collaboration. So, working together, we can all share the benefits of a flourishing environment and community well being. And we can already see examples of more just relationships developing. Uh, Te Awa Tupua, the Whanganui River Claim Settlement Act, which gives legal status to the river, uh, has been credited by Whanganui Iwi leader Gerard Albert for moving beyond co-governance in terms of caring for the river um, to a system of community governance. And there, the Act establishes a 17-member collaboration of hapu, iwi, local government, and other community interest groups, all working together effectively. And as Gerard Albert says, removing barriers to cooperation and making democracy work better for all. 
other local and regional examples include the Waikato River Authority, and that was created in 2010, and the authority involves iwi and the Crown working to support the health and well-being of the Waikato River, riparian planting, restoration of tributaries, enhancing people's access and connections to the river are unlocking better outcomes for all in the catchment. In Auckland, we have the example of the Paurewa Creek uh, Recreation Reserve. It's governed by Ngāti Whātua Wārāke Reserves Board and the Auckland Council. Um, the area used to be a pony club, uh, but in the past few years has been transformed into a native plant nursery, uh, is being replanted uh, with native bush, uh, and there are food gardens. So Ngāti Whātua Wārāke have a marakai whānau distribution, where each week whānau can collect their greens. So this is for the benefit of the iwi uh, and all the people. Of Each of these examples was the result of negotiations for the settlement of claims of historical breaches of Te Tiriti. In each case, fought hard for decades to have those rights recognised. But there's actually no reason why those arrangements need to be tied to those historical breaches. They each seek to restore respectful, balanced relationships between people and with the natural environment. And they ought to be the kind of relationships that are really just business as usual for in Aotearoa. And we have many other examples of steps other communities in Aotearoa are choosing to take on a path to more just relationships. Some councils, for example, have created the beginnings of more mana enhancing funding arrangements uh, for example, in the Bay of Plenty, the, the regional council there and the Te Arua Lakes Trust have created Te Papa Ahurewa, which is an independent advice mechanism for iwi. In Taranaki, the regional council have also set up something similar with Te Kotahi Tanga o Te Atiawa. Uh, so these are all exciting steps on the path towards just relationships. These steps help to create a stronger democracy uniquely grounded here in Aotearoa which is why we should do the people of Aotearoa and the environment a favour and retire those stale ideas that narrow our vision and limit our potential. Kia ora koutou. Oh, kia ora koutoua. It's such, such a privilege to, um, to hear from Kaun and Maria. Um, I'm delighted to now welcome everyone to the panel session. Um, so we've got nearly all of our speakers here today, um, as well as Taylor. Uh, please go ahead and put uh, your questions in the in the Q and A uh, forum or the discussion forum. It would be great to to hear from you and um, take the opportunity to hear from these amazing people and about about all of their mahi. Um, I'm I'm again really keen to ask um, where where do you envision SO seven going and the priorities being over the next couple of years of the of the project. Oh, kia ora. Um, so where we're focused on very much is thinking about what Te Tiriti led governance would look like. Uh, so we've, we're doing some work to um, kind of bring out case studies which highlight where there are good relationships happening and, and identify what it is within those the way those relationships are organized and structured and decision making is organized that that are, are leading to good outcomes in terms of 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 both the tariti relationship but also more significantly for um for the natural environment uh, and so the, there's also thinking about what what are the structures there, what what's the legal arrangements and the the legal structures that are either enabling those relationships to be effective or that are placing obstacles in the way of them, and how can we how can we reduce the obstacles um, and, and provide more enabling mechanisms, including resources as well. Oh, amazing, thank you, um, Ali or Carly. Do you have any? Anything to add or? I think Khan covered it pretty well. Um, I was also just thinking um, how we talk about environmental relationships as well as another focus that we're looking at and how to um, have better frameworks or have, have or enable better relationships so that we can sort of talk about difficult um, and hard 
issues um, together in ways that are mana enhancing for everyone. Mm. Thank you. Are there any case studies that you're particularly excited about? Carmen and Maria did raise quite a few of them, um, but there are also quite a few local government um, arrangements that I've been looking at that are quite exciting about the different ways that um, Iwi and Hapu and Mana Whenua are working with council and there's you know, quite a broad spectrum of, spectrum of those in different ways. Sometimes they don't seem necessarily that like legislatively powerful, but the relationships are strong. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, we've I've got, got a part though. Oh, sorry, continue. No, sorry, go ahead, Taylor. Um, so I, there was something I really latched on to, to Ellie's quote at all um, around how, you know, as we become, you know, as we become better treaty partners and, uh, you know, Māori are drawn on more, um, and we see this all the time in terms of the almost burden that Māori are now under to contribute to almost every new um, uh, sort of ecological thing that's happening. Um, certainly um, we, um, with the work that we do here in Ōtipoti in terms of the same people requiring to input on all the things, how can we ensure that the, that, you know, the, the tikanga, the te ao Māori, te reo Māori, all those uh, are sort of protected um, amongst that real high demand for them to be brought in and and used uh, so readily now. Yeah, so that's sort of something I've been thinking about in my masters and looking at care and the labour um, that Māori do within the environmental space um, in all different forms, but also not just in environmental space, it's in health in, in many ways. Um, and often tikanga is being used um, to support better systems for everyone, um, but sometimes that doesn't always like directly relate to better outcomes for Māori communities from which tikanga comes from. So yeah, there are difficult things that we have to think about. Um, I don't think that there's one answer, but something that Aroha Mead once said um, was, you know, tikanga needs to first benefit um, the communities that it comes from so we need to ensure that you know if we're using Māori knowledge um, that Māori communities are resourced and, and enabled to um, do that um, and also that that it benefits the people from which it came from first so that um, we're not continuing power imbalances that have been occurring for generations in New Zealand um, and in my research I look at a political ethic of care um, and how that might help facilitate and transition to more just relationships in the sense of a political ethic of care really focuses on power and privilege and, and how we can sort of um, have more equitable relationships by um, reflecting on our power and privileges that we bring to a relationship. And I don't think that's what an answer necessarily to your question because it's kind of a big question, but I guess, yeah, really being self-reflective about how we use tikanga um, and yeah, uh, does anyone else want to add to that, Carl? <laughs> oh, I think I think you've covered that really well, Ali. You know, really important, and amongst that is is the um, that resources should follow the expertise. So that if if we are going to value um, tikanga and mātauranga Māori, then there ought to be resources which support that. And as Ali's talked about too, a recognition of not just um, resourcing, but ensuring that uh, that that that's being valued in decision making and that the people who hold um, the mātauranga and who have expertise in tikanga are also trusted and valued in the decision making processes as well. Mm. Oh, kia ora kora. Um, awesome answers. We've got five minutes left, left and we've got some questions coming through uh, which are all really interesting. I'll um, I'll start with Joanne's one because Carly it would be awesome to, to hear from you. Uh, she, Joanne Clapcott asks, uh, Kia ora Carly, from your experience, what projects have Te Wai Māori supported that have had the biggest impact for Māori governance or management of fresh waters? It's probably a cumulative impact, like through our two funds, Wai Oro and Te <laughs> We don't have a great deal of resources compared to um, funds that are available through government. So we liked, like the ideal kind of outcome is that they're used as a nest kind of a fund to kind of 
start projects off and then can go on to to get um, wider funding through these kind of bigger funds that are available. Um, yeah, and a lot of our projects have kind of tended to focus around tuna as well, which is a, such a spiritually and culturally significant species. Um, and so we have had some awesome mahi recently throughout tuna steering group, which is um, then um, Te Manu Nga Tuna. Um, and we recently released a series of documentaries, which I would encourage people to have a look at because they're great. It shows kind of the on the ground mahi taking place and supported by the trust. And a lot of our directors are actually doing kind of both. They're in that governance role and they're also supporting on the ground work. And you'll see some of them featured in the documentaries, which is great. Namahi, thank you. Um, all right, I think we'll try and wrap up too. We've got some big questions coming up, so we'll um, try and squeeze them in. We've got an interesting one here from Dwayne, thinking about uh, Catherine Fabria's talk about decolonizing research internationally. What research, uh, what lessons or work do you think could be applied in other countries or places with multiple treaties, such as Canada? Yeah, so, you know, I think one of the things that we would see as, as Maria and I talked about in our presentation is Te Tiriti can provide a, a framework for thinking about implementing um, better relationships and just relationships between people and the environment. Um, but you don't need Te Tiriti to, to think about what just relationships looks like. Um, and so we would hope that uh, while there's a, there's a useful framework there, that those kinds of relationships um, and some of the mechanisms for delivering uh, good, balanced, just relationships uh, mm -hmm. between people and between people and the natural environment uh, are also applicable elsewhere in the world and indeed in the work that we're doing we're very much drawing on the experiences of indigenous people uh, and other parts of the world in the way in which they talk about their relationships as well and so th that's why we've kind of been using this language about about just relationships trying to think about what it means to be in right relationship or to be in good relationships with one another Beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you, Carwin. Um, the final question or two questions, I think we can wrap together a little bit. Um, so, sorry, team. I just I went for a bit of an adventure. Um, <laughs> I'll try to wrap this question up real quickly. Um, essentially, um, how how any thoughts on how the national and, um, discourse and political environment impacts research and outcomes. Um, and Aaron's also asked a slightly related question, thinking about um, uh, sort of the different perspectives, I suppose, we have in society. Um, for example, uh, parts who have a knee-jerk reluctance or opposition uh, that's, you know, driven, often driven by by fear of exclusion um, and so on. Any any thoughts on on that? Ellie, did you want to talk a little bit about this in the context of the work we're doing with the workshop? Yeah, so, I mean, there has been quite a lot of discussion recently about co-governance and some of it quite divisive in, in its nature. And we've been working with the workshop, um, who are a sort of media and communications um, group, and working on how um, to frame issues about like co-governance to help support um, helpful thinking in this area instead of divisive um, thinking about co-governance. But I can see Aaron's question there as well, and um, just thinking, you know, how do we get past the fear-based opposition? Well, we've been sort of trying to work that through um, and been doing different testing um, in terms of like different language for co-governance, but also different language for Māori, Rangati, Batanga, um, and how to support um, better um, frames. And I guess, um, from our initial research, it's talking about being better together, um, which we kind of heard through Carlin and Maria's discussions um, as well. Um, yeah, but also, um, sorry, just thinking again about other stuff we've been doing. We've been talking about like our different um, audiences that we try and, and talk to because there are some people in society in a small group um, 
who will never want to talk about co-governance in helpful ways, probably. Um, and they're not, you know, the people that we're going to try and spend our time convincing. So that's been something that we've been thinking about too, about finding our audiences who we are able to persuade and talk to about it in, in helpful ways and have helpful dialogue about working together um, and in order to support our environment. Oh, kia ora koutou. Thank you so much for your time and, and knowledge. Um, I, I know I and I'm sure everyone else really, really appreciates it. I'll, I'll pass back to Taylor now for the final part of the session. Um, please do feel free to keep the discussion going in the, in the forum as well. Oh, kia ora. So huge mihi to uh, all of us. I'm just now going to introduce our last speakers of this session, Susie Wood and Marcus Vandegos. Uh, Susie and Marcus are program leaders for the MB funded project Our Lakes Health, Our Lakes Health Past, Present and Future, part of the Lakes 380 project. Uh, the program team is obtaining a nationwide overview of the health of about 10% of the lakes in Aotearoa. A combination of paleo, environmental and limnological approaches are used, including sediment coring, novel proxy analysis, uh, geochronology and mataranga Māori to reconstruct water quality and lake health over the past 1,000 years and provide a richer understanding for the values of lakes here in Aotearoa. So I'll hand over to them for this last talk of the session. Sorry, my slides are not advancing the moment. So Tinakoto Katoa, uh, Ko Susie Wood Takuenua. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and um, for joining us this morning. So yeah, I'm Susie Wood from the Cawthorn Institute. I'm a freshwater scientist and molecular ecologist, and I'm going to be co-presenting today with uh, Marcus van der Goes, who's a paleoecologist based at GNS Science. And yeah, we're going to be talking about a project which we're hugely passionate about uh, that we've been working on for the last four years, um, and it's really its aim is to understand the current and historic health of lakes in Aotearoa. So there are 3,800 lakes and greater than one hectare in Aotearoa and the, the blue dots on this map show the location of these. And for such a small country, we've got this amazingly diverse, uh, rich um, collection of lakes. And these range from large glacial lakes to, to small alpine lakes. And so with such an amazing collection of diverse lakes, you'd think that our scientific knowledge on these lakes would be uh, equally as rich. But what I'm going to show you now uh, in the orange dots here is the lakes that we currently monitor and the lakes that we have some long-term scientific information on. And so this is less than about 5% of New Zealand's lakes. And of those lakes that we monitor, uh, most of those are in, in lowland, highly modified catchments. Um, and the monitoring records are very short, so they may only span one or two decades. And so this means that there's, there's huge areas of Aotearoa which we know very little about our lakes, such as down here in, in Fiordland. Um, and we also know uh, almost nothing about what those lakes were like prior to human arrival and their, in, in many cases their subsequent uh, degradation. And so this makes it really challenging when we're thinking about restoring uh, lakes and their biodiversity. And it also, um, you know, when we're thinking about informed um, intervention or mitigation plans, it's um, really difficult if we don't know what's caused their degradation. Um, so this, this lack of knowledge really prompted um, my colleagues and I to come up with um, a very ambitious project that's called um, Our Lakes Health Past, Present, Future. Um, as I said before, we've been working on this for about four years. And so we set out to sample and we, we have achieved this around about 10% of um, natural lakes across Aotearoa. And this map just shows the, the distribution of these and we aim to collect um, samples across a, a highly representative um, lakes right the way from right the way across the country um, and when we uh, arrive at each lake um, we take surface water and, and sediment samples to understand uh, more about the current health and biodiversity of those lakes and we also collect sediment core samples so these sediment cores that you can see pictured here are like a um, storybook back in time and we can look at the different layers of those sediment cores and, and apply a range of um, different scientific techniques understand how and why uh, the history of or how and why these lakes have changed and in addition to the biophysical work we've also been doing exploring the social and cultural histories of the of our lakes and, and we'll tell you a little bit about those shortly 
So today we're just going to provide you a really small snapshot of some of the work that's underway in the program um, and we refer you to our website to learn more about the amazing diversity of, of projects underway. So we wanted to highlight some of our work which helps us understand how healthy our lakes are now um, and how we can learn use the sediment cores to learn from the past with a particular focus on biodiversity today and then the work that we've been doing around uh, weaving different knowledges to enrich um, our understanding of, of lakes. So one of the, the real challenges uh, with current methods that we use to analyse water quality is that we, we go out to the centre of a lake and we take a sample and we analyse its nutrients and, and algae in there. And we have to do this monthly for three to five years to gain a real insight into the health of that lake. And obviously this is, is costly and time consuming and it really limits the number of lakes that we can assess. So the method that we've developed under this program involves taking a surface sediment sample and, and surface sediments are wonderful in, uh, integrators of time and they, they represent what's happened in a lake over weeks to months. And we've applied molecular techniques to characterize the bacteria of those. And then using statistical methods, we've been now to identify indicator taxa and develop a, a molecular based method to, with a single sample, um, predict what the quality or the health of that lake is like. And so we've been able to apply this uh, for the first time to 300 samples across uh, 300 lakes across New Zealand and really have a, a wonderful national picture and have expanded this further to um, using spatial modeling techniques to look at the, the health of lakes right the way across the country. So for our 3,800 lakes. And so this map here shows the picture of, of the health of our lakes um, and, if, and it's, I guess it's not a very easy one to, to look at in some ways. And so uh, around about 46% of our lakes are in um, poor or, or worse condition. And this is um, even more pronounced up in the North Island where 81% of our lakes are in poor or very poor condition. And I'm um, gonna hand over to Marcus now, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about how we're using these same techniques to look at changes back in time. I'm Kia ora koutou, ko Marcus van der Thank you, Susie. Um, so just picking up on where Susie left off, we've been able to apply some of these techniques um, down through the sediment core and understand the history of how the lakes, the, the health of the lakes and water quality have changed through time. So this is an example from Lake Polnui uh, in the Wairarapa. And just to orientate you here, there's a sediment core uh, along the bottom of the screen. So the oldest is to the left uh, and the youngest uh, part of the sediment core to the right and we see some sort of key age tie points across the top there of this graph uh, 1400 1840 and so on so we can see the gray curve through here is changes in water quality um, through time through this time of of the of the lake and uh, going back um, highlighting that we can see sort of pre-human and during early Māori periods there, uh, periods of early Māori interaction, that the, the lake had quite a good water quality, um, mesotrophic, oligotrophic, based on our indicators. And then coming to more recent times, we see that that is uh, quite quickly um, degraded based on our tr trophic level TLI indices there uh, up until the present day. Next slide. We can also then utilize these sediment cores to explore a range of other things that are, that are uh, trapped in, in the sediment core. So for example, uh, historic biodiversity of, of a range of different things. And this example there now is um, looking at the biodiversity of fish um, using environmental DNA. So again, the sediment core along the bottom um, representing uh, the oldest to the left and the youngest to, to the right. Um, so we can see here, this is from Lake Paringa on the west coast of the South Island. Um, we can see that looking at uh, galaxid species and the presence of those uh, in, in, the, in the lake. So there's a, there's a, a range of different species represented here, um, some dominant ones, which is the, the green ones. We haven't got it down to an exact species type. And then we have a number of other species represented by the blue bars. As we move forward in time, we see this start to change, um, particularly with the introduction of uh, trout into the, into the lake catchment. And we see that we have um, diversity uh, changing and, and a loss of diversity from these other species. Uh, next slide. Uh, um, so, I mean, before I get onto that, I mean, these sorts of information are, are um, you know, quite useful and quite critical for um, being able to uh, get some baseline information on how these lakes have changed through time, how the how the species have changed through time, and that helps us um, with our partners, regional council partners, iwi, um, as well to develop you know management plans and and um, uh, 
mitigation strategies where needed. We just quickly focus now um, on on some of our uh, weaving of knowledges um, that we've been doing as part of the project. We've been focusing on and, and highlighting some of the digital storytelling platforms that we've been utilizing as, as part of this project to um, convey the, the different knowledges that we that we are, are using. And um, we can, we've been using a collection of videos and documentaries, and these can be seen on our Lake Stories website there. I encourage you to go and look at that. Um, these highlight the importance of the values of the lakes, the cultural uses and, uh, of, of the lakes themselves and the Tonga species uh, within them. Um, and also highlighting the weaving of the knowledges as well, um, the mataranga, the biophysical and, and social science uh, knowledge that we have. We'll go to the next one. And uh, moving on, we've also been exploring the use of virtual reality platforms. Um, this here is a collaboration with Ngāti Kawata and DOC um, for Lake Mafitu on Turbal Island. Um, the platform will be launched uh, next week, at the end of next week. Um, you'll be able to see this on our website. And the idea is that the virtual reality platform is used to bring together these knowledges um, and recognise the future aspirations of the lake. So we can see the present day um, uh, lake at the moment, we can go in and, and click on touch points to explore the lake a little more, the state of the ecosystem um, and, and the health of lake at the moment, the types of species or, that are there or not there. We can then move through time, um, looking at the, the pre-human uh, landscapes. This is all reconstructed from our sediment cores, knowledge and things, looking at the baseline state of the lakes, the ecosystem and how it was different than it is today and explore the biodiversity. We can then uh, look at, um, at at the time of Māori settlement, capturing the mataranga and the oral histories and the importance of these sites for Māori uh, in Ngāti Kawata, and, use, and this is all presented through touch points of information panels and video clips. And we can then look at the future aspirations, um, the mahi underway to do planting and, and restoration in the catchment and in the lakes. Um, and this allows us to conceptualize the, the history, the current state and the vision of the lakes um, and bring this out to a wider audience. It also is, is a means to set the restoration targets uh, in a way and explore the outcomes and what they might look like um, over a hundred year sort of vision. And that's us at the end of the slides um, and the presentation. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to our team. Um, there's over 70 national, international um, scientists, iwi partners, students and support on this project. Um, and yet we're happy to take any questions now. Thank you. So we just have one question coming through before we wrap up and that's in your sediment cores, you showed obviously some degradation with time, but you also showed some periods where it seemed that water quality was improving. Uh, what do you, do you have any idea what was causing those periods of improvement? So, so this this uh, metric is is based on on the sort of trophic level indices um, that that we we highlighted. I mean, there is natural variability within a lake system um, through time, and and you know there will be algal abundance, there will be there will be changes in chlorophyll content. Um, so the lakes have um, a history of change embedded in them, and that's part of why we want to look. Uh, back before humans um, arrived in the landscape so that we can see what that natural baseline, that natural variability is. There are a bunch of other drivers that can uh, cause cause changes to water quality and these are natural um, uh, disturbances such as earthquakes, um, it can be climate change, it can be a whole bunch of other things and volcanic eruptions can all influence those systems. In Lake Panui's case, for example, we do know that there is a large earthquake signature um, back in that sediment core, and that has influenced uh, its its algal content and some of the indicators we would use um, for lake health uh, in time. So whether that was exactly related to that point that you were talking there, um, we'd have to look at that, but, but we are exploring that yet. I think we probably have time for one more, actually. Um, how does your corridor... Um, oh, how does the current national discourse and political environment impact the research outcomes here? Sorry, I'm just going to, how does the current political environment? That was, um, yeah, in relation to these research outcomes, how does the current national discourse and political imp environment impact the research outcomes in this case? 
Oh, Aroha Mai, Tyler. I think that might be from the previous session. Oh, okay. But not <laughs> enough, <though. laughs> I was going to ask for something a little more specific there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did think it was a very general question. That's all right. That makes Sorry. more sense. All right. Well, I will um, wrap us up then unless you have anything, Ashley. Fantastic. So just before I hand over to Edward for a karakia, um, a reminder that we'll be back here uh, in about an hour's time. And a reminder that at 12.30, we will be uh, hosting a networking session. Um, so go out of this session and go to the main page and then click on the networking session, join in there and catch up with some people and meet some new people and you know have some good conversations about all the amazing stuff we've been learning today. Uh, there is also the meeting hub so you can catch up with people individually there. Uh, and a reminder that all the sessions um, from the whole conference will be available for three months after this. So you can come back and watch them anytime and enjoy them and, you know, just really take in all the amazing corridor that we've been having. So I'll hand over to Edward now. Uh, kia ora, Taylor. Me koutou katoa, ngā mihi atu kia koutou. Look, it's been great pleasure to be on the uh, session this morning. Fantastic to see the thinking, the work, the research. Uh, that is going on. A real pleasure to be a part of that. So ngā mihi, and happy to close off now with a uh, karakia for the, the session that will just uh, come through. Nō reira, uh, kia tau, kia tātou katoa, te ata whaiato tātou āriki, ai hū kwaiti me te aroha o te atu me te whiwhinga takitau ki te wairo e tapu, āke āke, āmene. Pira tātou.